cities are really on a, a cutting edge of some of this work, and in, from within the cities, we are trying to fundamentally change how we do what we do, from paving streets to building bridges to lighting our streets to building our, our buildings and our schools. There's a, there's a pretty significant transformation happening on the ground in city government, which is very exciting because we have kind of done the same thing that we've done for a very long time. So there's a lot of opportunities for innovation. We haven't figured out yet how to get these trucks to, to pump out the plants like this, but that's coming, that's coming very soon. I have a really good feeling about that. So what I want to talk to you a little bit about is the network of cities that is, that is uh, forming to help to drive this innovation and support each other so that we're not all kind of fa falling into the same traps as, as munici municipalities. We know uh, 1,200 or more cities across uh, at least the U.S. and Canada signed on to Kyoto-level carbon reductions, so there's a lot of interest and motivation among cities to drive this change, partly because we're seeing a, a lack of leadership on a federal level, so the cities said, well, we're going to step up and help to make this happen. But what we realized and what I realized when I was working on this in the mayor's office in Chicago was I was kind of out there alone. Our mayor was out saying, we're going to be the greenest city and competing. So all of our mayors were competing and then staff on the ground are saying, okay, how do we do this? We're, we're really, uh, many of us just kind of struggling to figure out what lessons are there and how do we, how do we learn from each other? So I was one of the co-founders of a network of cities. And uh, we, we started in uh, 2008 and 2009. You can see that's our little network at the bottom. There weren't that many of us. We were just trying to figure out who was who and who was doing what. And then you can see our network and the depth of our network has grown to 2011 where you can see that's the level of engagement between our members. So we, we started from just, uh, do you know this X person or who's doing what, to really deep engagement with each other. And you can see on the bottom by 2011, the average number of ties between our members, that's the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, is 26. So that means I know 26 people on average that I'm engaging with on a regular basis to share these lessons and, and experiences with. So this is our, this is our membership, and this is a, uh, it's about 100, um, 112 USDN members. We've limited our membership to keep the network small enough so that there really is interpersonal engagement that we can build on the relationships, not just a Rolodex. We represent about 47 million people in, uh, in our cities across North America. We are all city employees dedicated to driving the sustainability agenda in our cities. That is our sole focus, the sustainability director position. As you can see, we, we really wanted to focus on big and small and good geographic dispersal across North America to ensure that we were getting diversity of perspectives. So 90% uh, of our member sh members participate in one or more of our ongoing user groups. That's one of the things we found. We need to get together once a year, but we need to engage on a regular basis. We have a monthly conference call. We have an annual meeting, and then we started user groups based on people's interests. So we, we really, we won't do anything unless it's member-led. We have staff now. We are, we are a non-organization, so we didn't want to be competing with the other groups that are out there. We wanted to be a network. But we said we're not going to do anything unless a network member is driving that in, within, uh, within the committee. So here's some of the things that we're doing. We started out with networking, as I said, but then we realized like networking's great. Sharing lessons is really good. But, but what we really need is collaboration among our cities, because our mayors are competing. We need to collaborate with each other to bring our politicians along, actually. And so you s simple things like uh, a toolkit for, for an urban uh, sustainability director. What, what's your job description? Because oftentimes you come into a position, you don't even have a job description. It's do this. So what's your job description? How do you do your work? So best practices, supplier directories, um, matching funds. We've now started to create a series of funds to actually support each other's work. So we went from kind of networking and relationship building to actually developing tools and then deeper collaboration opportunities. So that's kind of where, we, where we're at right now. Uh, what we realize, again, back on the network theme here is, is that uh, a national network is really important, but a lot of this work is happening regionally. And um, as, as members of the, the, the larger network, we can actually help to create smaller regional networks to bring the municipalities along that are closer to us. So we have a series of uh, networks that are being led now across the country. And uh, those folks are getting together and, and talking and sharing lessons and actually working to bring our politicians along to, to collaborate in pushing for regional action. So we've, uh, we, we realized that a couple of years ago, uh, about a year and a half ago, that if, if uh, 50 million people are represented by our cities, if we could pick a few things and focus on them together, we could actually drive some significant national change, potentially, or international change. So we developed a, a bit of an innovation system now that we're starting to, to follow through with. 
uh, through our collaboration where we're scanning what's the best practice out there, documenting that, putting it on our internal website, then developing innovation opportunities and then um, piloting them and then disseminating them. And we've started a sustainable investment fund, which is about $200,000 a year, and we launched a capital campaign for uh, about a $3 million fund over, uh, over the next few years, which is a fund that we create, our members apply to us, and it's members on the selection committee that are giving those funds out, and it's largely to, to help collaboration, to get cities working together to drive the program. So we're Vancouver, we're partnering with San Francisco on local foods programs as an example through this kind of opportunity. So we've identified seven areas. We've got an innovation committee, and the innovation committee said there's seven areas we're going to focus on based on input from the network. There they are there. You can see seven is sustainable marketing campaigns, and one is large uh, scale behavior change. So those are two areas that really relate to the work that we've been doing here over the last couple of days. What we found um, is that uh, there's a lot of interest outside of, of our own network. And so we launched a, a program with the Funders Network for Smart Growth and Livable Communities, um, a matching fund for, for community foundations to work with the municipality and, uh, and then get money from this, this broader fund to support collaboration between the community foundations and the cities. Because we found many times these cities are working kind of in isolation and there's a community foundation that's funding a lot of the similar work. So we've created this matching fund to support that. And uh, so, so sustainable behavior is uh, one of our seven. I think it's one when you look at all of them that cities are um, most confounded by actually. And I want to show you some examples of actually what we're, what we're hearing through our surveys, that sustainability directors believe that they're tackling a huge behavior change challenge without the arsenal of tools that they need, which is interesting. I think we can actually change behavior as cities, and I'm going to demonstrate a few areas where we have. I think where we really struggle is communication and engagement. We can drive change. We've got lots of levers. But oftentimes, we're doing that kind of on our own, and we're not really engaging our residents. And so we're not creating that paradigm shift that we started to talk about last night. We're, we may be able to drive some change. We're frustrated with the broad campaigns that have failed them, and I'll talk about that as well. I've, I've been responsible for spending millions of dollars, and I'm not sure that those campaigns have actually delivered us results. There are things that we can do that deliver results, but the campaigns, buying ads, and all that kind of stuff doesn't seem to work for us. And we want to build our skills at community-based social marketing. That's an area where we've identified significant gaps. Cities are pretty traditionally structured, very, re very reactive to the media that's generated rather than being proactive. So we, uh, here's a little bit of snapshot of kind of how we're, we as members are involved in behavior change and communication. So we've got 17 members learning together um, over the year about how to apply community-based social marketing into our work. 25 members launched a user group, and uh, then we brought together a number, which I'll talk about in a sec, to replicate what New York has done with their studies. One thing we've learned, we're good at putting together plans. This is, the, this is the Vancouver plan. Get great media for it, it goes out, but it kind of falls with a thud on the ground for 99% of our population. We know that we can drive change. This, is, again, is Vancouver. We launched our climate plan in 2000. You can see we've actually had a result. We are on track this year. We're 5% below our 1990 carbon emissions as the overall community. We can achieve Kyoto. Federal governments, in many cases, actually can't do it. We know we can deliver change. We know we can deliver change in the context of growth. Vancouver is the lowest greenhouse gas emissions per capita in North America. We, uh, we are, at, as I said, about 5% right now below 1990 levels for the entire community, businesses and homeowners, while having grown our population 27% since that time and having grown jobs 18%. So the paradigm, it, it's, there, there is a shift to be made here. We can continue to grow our population and our economy while reducing carbon. But can we bring our people along with us? Can, we, can they kind of get what, what we're trying to do? We really do struggle with that. So a couple of specific examples, downtown trends is one of them. We've managed to increase our population living downtown 75%. So that is a significant behavior change among our residents, desiring to be down there. We've increased those jobs downtown by 26% in that period. We've enter people entering downtown have increased by 15% in that period of time. Vehicles entering downtown in that period of time has decreased 25%. So we have made a behavior shift there. We, we know we can make those kind of changes. We know we can actually bring down people's GHG in the process. So if you look at people living downtown, that's the, that's the center there. Your GHG impact is about 1, 1 1.5 metric tons per person, significantly lower than the rest of the area. So that kind of change that we're driving actually can have a GHG impact. 
We know we can create infrastructure projects like this one. This, we take waste heat from the sewer, we pull out the heat, and we use it to heat an entire neighborhood. If you live in this neighborhood, your greenhouse gas emissions are about 70% below anyone else in the city that's not in this district. We're taking waste heat out of the sewer, pulling it out, and using it to heat homes and hot water. But the people living there don't get it. We haven't figured out how to bring them along to make the connections with the other pieces. And that's, that's where we struggle as, as cities. We found we can, in, we can build the infrastructure. This is a bike lane. The month we put this in, we had huge uproar from the, the car community, huge. I mean, it was just like New York was facing. 400% increase in the bike morning commute, people using this infrastructure within the first month. So we, can't, we, can, we can build it, but what we can't do, from my experience working with these, these, communi these uh, communities across North America, we're having a hard time communicating. We're having a hard time finding ways to engage people in it. So this is an example. This is a compost program. We launched curbside composting. Like, wow, that's so great. You can put out your organics from your kitchen. The city will come and pick it up. We launched it. We spent a lot of money on ads. This is one of them. They're on billboards and all over. We had about 12, 10, 12% 12 participation across the city. That's like, that's kind of depressing. You know, you got a truck coming by, you got a bin now. What we didn't figure out how to do, what we, we really struggle with is how do we bring people along to understand the role that they play in it, the, the, the value that it brings to them. And I don't think Vancouver is alone in this. So what we did a pilot over the last six months in the area where we've, uh, we picked a 2,000 homes and we tried different community-based social marketing strategies in combination with changing the service. So we added the service and we shifted the garbage collection. So now instead of picking your garbage up every week, we pick up your garbage every other week. We pick up your organics every week instead of every other week. So we just flipped it. And we went door to door. We said, hey, here's a bin. Consider participating. We saw our participation go up to about 60% in the month, the first month that we did this. And so the, the, the piece, I think, is how do we communicate? How are we getting in front of people eye to eye, giving them something and saying, participate with us? And then how are we finding ways to, to, to broaden that and engage our communities in it? So I think that's, uh, through the work in the network, that is, I think, the challenge that we have. We've just received funding from Candida to do uh, an, an multiple pilots with our member cities to pick a number of strategies and see if we can drive the, that activity into those communities. And I, I'm going to cycle ahead. There's amazing work happening in a bunch of cities, Flagstaff, uh, Baltimore, New York, this work that we're doing with Garrison that came out of our summit last year. We've gotten some funding to replicate the work that New York's done. So now we're doing 17 cities on community-based social marketing. Here's the cities. These are the, the things we're doing. We're trying to do community-based and employee-based among our, our organizations. And simple things, line drying your clothes and using cold water settings. We're going to try to, that in those 17 cities to see what kind of uptake we can have. And then we're going to do the same thing with our employees. Can we change their behavior? And so that is going to happen over the next uh, probably year, year and a half, where we're actually going to really track across those cities can we use those, those tactics to drive that change and then broaden it perhaps to all of our members? So thank you very much.